So Hebrews chapter 11 is a great chapter for us to focus on because it's all about faith. We'll call it super faith, super, superhero faith, uh, meaning that this is a faith that you can't come to on your own. This is a faith that is a gift given to you by God. Your salvation starts with that kind of faith. You didn't work your way towards faith so that you could be saved. No, God gave you faith as a great gift and you acted in the faith that God has given you and he has gloriously transformed you in that. And our faith continues. In fact, Paul had to make that argument with the church of the first century saying, now who in the world has bewitched you to make you think that what you didn't begin, you now have to pick up and do on your own. He helps them to identify that you and I have to walk in faith. So this whole chapter is all about that. And so we're going to spend really till, the, till December talking about this. And I think it's going to be a great encouragement to us. So let's look in Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, Though he died, he still speaks. Now, if you remember, Eve conceived and gave birth to Cain and then later gave birth to her second son, Adam. Uh, some would want to argue about, now, when did that happen? Were they twins? Were they, did they come later in, in life from each other? I don't know. <laughs> the Bible didn't give us that. All we know, this is the way God wanted us to know it, that Eve had birth to Cain. Then she gave birth to Adam, and the boys grew up. Abel, of course, tended to the flocks, the herd, and Cain cultivated the ground. He was the vegetable grower. And during the time of the harvest, Cain brought his offering to the Lord, which was his produce from the land. And Abel brought among his fold the firstborn sacrifices unto God. They're both bringing sacrificial offerings. Abel is bringing one that is the best that he could give, and Cain brought one, which was the best that he thought he could give. But Abel brought his offering, the firstborn of the lambs, and it was acceptable to the Lord. The Lord accepts Abel and his offering, and the Lord rejects Cain and his offering. And when that happened, the Lord saw easily in Cain's heart that he was jealous, angry, discouraged, disappointed, and it even showed on his face. In fact, the Lord asked of him, why are you so angry and why do you look so dejected? And the Lord insisted to Cain, if you, you will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what's right, then watch out. For sin is crouching at the door, crouching at the door, eager to control you, you must subdue it or it will master you. Now, that's, that's a, an offshoot that we could take. We're not going to take it, but I'll just kind of look down that trail real quick with you for a moment. You and I need to be very guarded about the sin that lays ever so close to us. The enemy is constantly crouching in order to jump on us and devour us with his sinful ways. Now, in, in Cain's life, it was a disobedient rebelliousness about him that he wanted to do things his way rather than God's way. And there was a jealousy in him that he saw something in Abel that he did not have and that provoked jealousy and discontent in his heart. He really had an indifference to the word of God and the way of God and that's going to be evident in the text today. But it might be something else. It might be that anger is lurking there. Or, or it might be that uh, there was something going on in his life that the Lord saw in him that he's helping him to identify. You ought to watch for that. It's going to master you if you don't in faith master it. If you let that hang around, it's going to devour you. Hey, can I just ask you a question? Is there something the Spirit of God might be provoking in you these days? If you let that continue to hang around, it's going to devour you. It's going to be your master. You better master it before it masters you. And the way we do this is by coming to God in faith, 
obeying the word of God by faith. You won't do this on your own. Hey, if you're battling anger right now, you're not going to be able to battle that to victory on your own. If you're battling lust right now, then you're not going to be able to win that battle on your own. If you're battling with substance abuse or alcohol abuse or whatever it is in your life, materialism that you're battling and you're thinking, I'm going to be able to conquer this, can I just tell you what Hebrews 11 wants you to know is that you better trust God to do something by faith in your life to help you to identify the sin, help you identify the one who can overcome the sin, and you and me walk with him. Don't let that crouch at the door and devour you, master over you. God has given you the means through Jesus, his son, to master it. I think we're going to see that throughout the entirety of this chapter, to, to let God elevate in your life with great faith. Now, Cain didn't do that. And this discontent, rebelliousness, and anger, and jealousy all built up to a point that it came to a climax. One day, he lures his brother out to the field, and he attacks him there. Premeditated or not, I don't know, but he kills his brother in the field. And afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Abel flippantly replies to him, what, am I my brother's keeper? Am I his guardian? And the Lord exposes the truth saying, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And the Lord judged and cursed Cain that day and required him to depart and not be in his presence. Now since that fateful day of the fall of mankind, God had been speaking about a deliverer. One that would be an offspring of woman who would destroy the enemy. He would crush his head, strike his head. And although we don't have the specific instructions, it's clear that God had given them very directive about how to approach him until the deliverer comes how do you approach God in sacrifice how do you approach him in worship and I believe that he told that to Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and the evidence would be clear you can make some assumptions and I think the assumptions are good that Cain and Abel knew the place where they should be worshiping God they knew the place where that should happen because they both bring their offerings to the Lord. And God had prescribed the official time in which that sacrifice was to take place. Genesis chapter 4 verse 3 notes that Cain and Abel brought their offering in the course of time. If, if you looked in the original language of the Bible, you would see that that could also be translated very easily at the end of time. In other words, God had given a season, and at the end of that time, in the course of that time, it was complete, and they brought their offering at the designated time of God at the distinct place that God had required of them. And God had given instruction to Adam and Eve and to Cain and Abel concerning the way to worship. In fact, God showed Adam and Eve first how to do this. It was God who first killed an animal, an innocent animal, to provide the clothing for which would cover Adam and Eve in their sinful shame. Now the sons of Adam certainly knew about what God required of sacrificial Worship. They knew about the time and place. God had instructed them to do so, either through their parents or him directly. We know that because one was accepted and one was not accepted. It indicates that they knew the will of God and the instruction of God. So at the end of this brief account with the brothers, we have one who is accepted by God and one who is rejected by God. And the reason why that simple truth is important for us is because it is with all of people, there will be at the end of time some who are accepted by God and some who are rejected by God. And that leads us to an all-important question. How can sinners be right before God and worship him? Because Cain and Abel are both sinners. How is it that sinners can come before God and worship him. 
Now be mindful that every directive given by God for approaching him with sacrifice and worship is pointing to Christ Jesus. Every one of those in the Old Testament, every one of those that you read about throughout the scripture is pointing to Christ who took our judgment upon himself, declaring us in that to be righteous and giving us newness of life. So everything is moving towards Christ. So when they are making sacrifices in the Old Testament, they are doing so believing that God would provide one who would take all those acts of faith and he would fulfill them and God would cleanse them of all unrighteousness. You know what's happening in the Old Testament, even on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, you know what's happening? God is atoning for his sins. That is, he is covering over their sins, knowing that there would be a day that Christ would come and he would take their sins upon himself to eradicate the sin of their life. He would cleanse them of all unrighteousness. And this great exchange would take place. God, by Christ Jesus, would take our sin from us and impute in us righteousness. And how would that be accomplished? But by Christ. So all the Old Testament sacrifices are moving to that point. And when Christ has accomplished that, it's done. We'll read about it later, but once Christ, the fulfillment and the ultimate sacrifice is made, then he sits down at the right hand of God the Father. It's over with. No more sacrifices needed. But throughout the Old Testament, they are all pointing to that glorious anointed one who would take away the sins of the world. He would be the perfect righteous lamb who alone could take away the sins of the world. So Abel, Abel has offered his sacrifice of some of his firstborn flock, and he's doing so by faith, and the Lord accepts that. And in that, he accepts Abel. His, Abel's conditioned heart was to make sacrifices God prescribed. Cain did the opposite. Cain attempted to come to God on his own terms without shedding blood. Now, later in the law of God, there's going to be all kinds of sacrifices that are acceptable. You'll find that you could actually take the grain offering and bring it in and bring it to the Lord, and the Lord was pleased with that. Or you could take the harvest of grapes and make wine with that and bring it as a drink offering to the Lord, and the Lord is pleased with that. So there's all kinds of different produce offerings that the Lord is agreeable upon. So you might say, well, why is he so bothered by Cain who offers that kind of produce from the land. Why is he rejecting that? I'll tell you why. Because in every other offering, it's required first for a burnt offering. There has to be an offering of blood given for the forgiveness of sins or the atonement of sins before any other offering is presented to the Lord. You don't give a thanksgiving offering without first dealing with your sin. In fact, every single time an offering is given, there has already been an offering given of shedding of blood. That's an important point for us because sin has to be dealt with first. When you're coming to God with gratitude, when you're coming to God requesting, sin has to be dealt with first. And so our faith is in Christ who alone can take the sin and deal with it in accord with God's prescription. How does God prescribe that? He prescribes it to be dealt with by the shedding of blood. So Abel is the first example of faith in Hebrews 11, illustrating the most crucial first step of faith. Abel has this, and that is he believed that sin separated him from God and it must be dealt with in the way that God prescribes. This is where faith has started. All right, so we're going we're gonna to look through a lot of different characters in Hebrews 11. But the first one is Abel. And you might think, why does he start with Abel? Because Abel helps us to recognize our first step of faith is understanding and trusting and believing that our sin separates us from a holy God and that sin has to be dealt with by faith. Before anything else, sin has to be dealt with in the way that God prescribes. Romans lays this plan out very well for us in the New Testament. It's a passage you're probably very familiar with, especially the first part. For all have sinned and fallen short 
of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now, there's a lot of prepositional phrases. I can tell you the Apostle Paul is the king of prepositional phrases. But you just kind of have to slow down with a pencil in your hand and bracket those phrases and circle those key words and draw the arrows to where he's coming from, where he's going to. Let's backtrack a little bit before we get into that last part of the uh, verse 25. So he wants us to understand that everybody has sinned. We've all fallen short of what God's requirement is in his perfect law. That's his glory. There's not anybody in here, it doesn't matter how polished you are, there's not anybody in here that is not sin and full of sin, fallen desperately short of God. So, but look, how in the world are we in relationship with God? God justifies us. God makes it just as if we don't have that sin in our life. And he does so as a grace gift it's not something we've earned. It's a gift that God has given just out of his grace. And what is that? It's by the redemption of Christ Jesus. In other words, Christ has bought us unto God the Father by taking our sin upon himself and giving to us his righteousness, justifying us, exchanging our sin for his righteousness. And Christ, of course, was put forward as the propitiation. That means that God was fully satisfied in his justice and wrath. God was fully satisfied that Jesus would take our sin upon himself and die with it there. That all of the payment is fully exercised in Christ and God is satisfied with that. So we, you and I who have salvation receive that by faith. This is the way we're saved. This is the way we deal with sin. We take it to Christ and we say, Christ, there's nothing we can do to transform who we are. There's nothing that we can do to wash away this sin in our life. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves not to be sinners. We trust you to transform everything in us, to take the payment and the penalty of our sin and let God be justified in that. Let him be pleased with that. And of course, this is to show God's righteousness, verse 25 says, for in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. You know what he's talking about there? Abel. He's talking about Abel and every other person of the Old Testament prior to Christ. It's death on the cross and resurrection. He's talking about people who trusted God to provide. God looked over their sin because they had faith to the point that Christ would pay for it. And that's his forbearance. He was bearing that sin throughout time until the time was accomplished that his son would be glorified there on the cross. What a glorious truth that is. So Cain believed in God, right? Cain's the one that offers his fruit and veggies, right? He believed in God or he would not have made that sacrifice to God. As one person said, Cain believed in God. The problem is Cain didn't believe God. And there is a big difference to that. Someone or somehow he thought that he could approach God in the best way that he desired rather than obeying God's instructions. But listen. Nobody comes to God without shedding blood. No one. Here's what the scripture says. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now, without being brash, let me point out that some of you may be making Cain's mistake. You may believe in God and you may be wanting to draw near to God, but you're doing it on your own terms. Assuming that your way is good enough. But like Cain, you've cultivated and you've gathered and you've presented your very best to God. But it falls short. Maybe it's you're offering your best life to God. Lord, conscientiously, I'm attempting to make my life cleaner. 
Lord, I'm purposefully coming to your place of worship. I'm singing. If not singing, I'm humming. And if not humming, I'm reading the words. <laughs> but here I am, God. And Lord, I'm even giving some. And I'm doing some. Lord, I'm doing the best I can. But see, Cain's mistake shouldn't be your mistake. Believing in God and then offering him the best that you can. Instead, you ought to believe God and trust him for his instruction. His best is found in his perfect, righteous son, Jesus. Put your faith in Christ. Surrender your life to him. Trust him alone to deal with your sin. Trust him to transform your life, to make you righteous. Trust him to declare you holy before a holy God. Trust him. I, I hope that you're understanding the difference in that. Because to be no better off than Cain means that you are rejected as God rejected him. And your offerings to God are rejected because he is going to reject all people who are not willing to walk in faith and obedience to Jesus Christ who shed his blood as our righteous sacrifice. Now, of course, Cain was highly offended at that. He was bothered and upset that God didn't accept his offering, but the Lord never consents to our unbelief and our disobedience. And even though the Lord attempted to correct him, Cain remained defiant and angry and depressed. And those negative emotions built up until they burst out in a murderous rage against his brother. Now, only one offering is acceptable by God. And it's the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Even those offerings that are good and pleasing in the Old Testament were so because they pointed to the fulfillment that Christ would provide. So therefore, our faith must be in Christ, who is the perfect offering on our behalf. Now, let me just walk you through a couple of verses or passages that I think are important. They're in your handout at least the address is, John 10, verse 9, and then 14 and 15. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So if you want to come in and out in the goodness of God, then you have to enter in by faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is alerting you that he alone is the way to the Father. He goes on to say, I'm the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Or how about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, says it this way, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not of a result of works, so that no one may boast. I could go on and on in verses like that. It's a repeated mantra throughout the scripture that you cannot come to God through your own works and efforts. We approach the holy God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And what a glorious truth that is because all the weight and the burden that you have on you for trying to appease God gets lifted. And Jesus completes all the fulfillment that God requires of all mankind. And he gives that to you as a gift as he is forgiving you of your sin. You know what the best way for us to communicate this is in the church corporately? Believer's baptism. Baptism is the expression of this great truth. It, it's why it's an all-important first response in obedience to Jesus Christ once you're saved. In fact, in the New Testament, you'll find it just in tandem. People are believing and they are baptized. They believe and they're baptized. They believe and they're baptized. You don't find a disconnect like that in Scripture. Some, for some reason, among Christendom today, there's a disconnect from that. Uh, you might ask, well, when do you baptize? I'm asked that when folks are saved, I'm asked, when are you going to schedule the baptism? I said, we do baptism every single Sunday. Somebody is willing to be baptized. 
we're not going to schedule it off in the future because baptism is your first obedient response to Christ. You know why? Because it pictures so beautifully what we're talking about here. It's an a, expression and an understanding of our faith relationship to God that is only possible with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So when you step into those baptistry waters, you're communicating that it's only by Christ's death that I join him that I can be saved. And it's only by the resurrection that I could be made new in Christ Jesus. I'm not doing this on my own. I'm joining in faith with Christ on the cross and I'm joining by faith with him in the resurrection resurrection. It's a declaration of your belief in what God has provided for you. I don't mean to point at you. If I knew who you were, I would though. If you have been saved and not baptized, I'm going to ask you a question. What are you waiting on? Let your declaration be, by God's grace, I've joined him on the cross to die. And by God's grace, I've joined him in the resurrection to walk newly in life. Dads, lead your children to be baptized. Take them there. Coach them. Guide them through the scripture. Talk of the importance. And at Meadowbrook, we'll even let you baptize them. Because we're trying to communicate that. That dads ought to be leading their children to faith. And obedience to Christ Jesus. Maybe some of you dads need to be baptized. I'll give you a little teaser. Next week we'll experience a baptism like you've never seen before. That's all I'm going to say. You want to be here next week. Here's the realities that are expressed in baptism. Speaking of Christ, he himself bore our sins on his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed, we have been made whole, for you are straying like sheep, but now you have now returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. Baptism publicly communicates that your faith and obedience are to Christ. And it is your announcement that in faith you share in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's an outward demonstration of this inward reality that you have died to sin and self and have been resurrected new in Jesus Christ. So by his spirit, you might walk in the newness of life. What a glorious image that is. So God accepted Abel because he trusted in the Lord to obedience. And he approached him in that way through the blood sacrifice and God will accept you who trust the sacrifice of God through Christ Jesus on your behalf. You can be accepted by God when you trust Christ. And God rejected Cain because he failed to obey the Lord. And he will reject all who are not cleansed by faith in Jesus Christ. So Hebrews 10 is an insightful word to the accomplishment of Christ and the hope that we have placed in him. Look what Hebrews 10 says coming into the passage that we're into today. Hebrews 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his sacrifice, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So there's a picture of the Old Testament sacrificial system that was pointing ultimately to Christ. It's like once one sacrifice happened, you knew at the end of that there would be another sacrifice. They, they were continual. Blood was running through Jerusalem there at the Temple Mount. But when Christ had offered for a time, for all time, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies would be made his footstool for his feet. For the single offering he has perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. Anybody saved want to say hallelujah to that? Hallelujah, hallelujah to that. Man, what good news. I can't tell you the regret in my life where sin has abounded. I can't tell you the overwhelming regret that washes over me sometimes. 
I can't tell you the times that I explained to God, here I am again asking you for forgiveness. And Lord, I know I had to do it yesterday and the day before and the day before. I can't tell you how the enemy at times wants to draw me away from God with all those thoughts rushing over me. And then to come and stand solidly on this, but Christ took all my sins, past, present, and future, and he has accomplished for me my cleansing and my righteousness, and I stand in Christ. Yes, some of you are struggling. You know what Abel's call is to us? Though he's dead, his voice is still heard by faith. By faith, trust in God's prescription for the blood of Christ to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So to summarize that whole section, Abel reveals how people come into the presence of God by faith. That's how it happens. It's not going to be by works. It's not going to be about you polishing up your life, getting rid of this and adding that. No, no, no. It's by faith. In Jesus. Then our passage reveals more about Abel saying that God commended him as a righteous man. Now how amazing is that? That God testifies and puts it on record in the Bible that Abel by faith was a righteous man. Now we know from 1 John chapter 3 verse 12 that Cain was unrighteous and Abel was righteous. I mean just outright says that. However, it would be wrong for us to conclude that God has accepted Abel's sacrifice based on his righteousness. That is not what's happening. It's not that he rejected Cain's offering because he, his life was sinful. The text clearly says that Abel made his sacrifice in faith and Cain made his sacrifice in his works. And that was the transformation. God declares people righteous and justified when by faith they come to him. And in Genesis, we see the beginnings of this. Genesis chapter 15, it said that Abraham believed the Lord. And the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. Now, that's one of those big texts in the Bible that if you mark in your Bible, you ought to have a big star by that one. Because that one's going to be picked up throughout the rest of the text. In fact, in the New Testament, it's picked up four different times. That God declares people righteous when they have faith. So let me just point out one of the sections that that's repeated in the New Testament. How about Romans chapter 4, verse 4 and 5? For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. Let me reframe that a little bit in a little bit more contemporary language. So when you work and they give you your paycheck, that's not a gift, right? You worked and you earned that. So he's making a distinction. Somebody who's working doesn't receive a gift. They get their due. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. So you see how that's a gift? Abel did nothing to bring about his righteousness. It was given to him as a gift because God gave him faith as a gift and he acted in it. And Cain works to try to accomplish and he doesn't. He can't accomplish righteousness and he can't accomplish something that's going to make it so that God says, I'm good with you and you're good with me. It doesn't happen that way. You won't get there by works. Verse 23 of chapter 4, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. So here's Paul taking those words of Abraham, about Abraham that he believed and God credited it to him as righteousness and now he's applying it to people of faith, to us. He's saying those words are not just about Abraham, they were written for us. For it was counted to us who believe in him who raised him from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So there we're trusting God to receive the payment of Christ on our behalf for our sin. 
and justifying us for our sin by giving us his righteousness. How about chapter 5, verse 1 and 2? Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into his grace, which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So God pardons us on the basis of Christ Jesus' sacrificial death, which satisfies the penalty of sin that was belonging to us, but Christ himself paid for us. Jesus bore our sin and God's wrath as our substitute, and then he graciously imputed in us his righteousness the moment we place our faith and trust in him. So to believe the gospel, truth, is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in that we find ourselves walking more righteously season by season. So if you're going to walk in faith righteously, it will first be because Christ has given you righteousness. And as you trust him for that by faith, you will walk more and more righteously. It's the reason why it's emphatic that you understand you are not a sinner, you are a saint. And you've been made a saint by Christ Jesus himself. And when you understand that you're a saint and the provision of holiness lives within you, then you can begin to express that walking righteously. Let me put it another way. We are forgiven for our unrighteousness and we are given the gift of God's righteousness. By declaration, Christ has deposited in us righteous ways. And righteousness. Now to reverse that order and an attempt to walk to righteousness is to deny the gospel. The gospel is the righteousness of God has been brought to us and we walk from that righteousness. And so Abel lived by faith. He walked by faith. Which brings me to this summary point. Abel exposes how people live righteously, and they do so by faith. So as you're walking and you're dealing with the temptations of the flesh, you're dealing with the temptations of the world, you're dealing with the temptations of the enemy, you can trust God to help you to walk by faith. You can trust God to walk righteously. Now let's look at this final section here. Finally, Abel helps us to identify the extraordinary significance of people who have faith in God and are obedient to him. If your faith is in God and you're obedient to him, your life will be significant. Now somebody might ask the question, well, how in the world is Abel's life significant? It was cut down short as he was murdered. We don't know anything else about Abel other than he was murdered. He offered a sacrifice. He was lured into a field, and then he was murdered. How is that a significant life? Well, beyond the writings of Genesis and Hebrews, Abel's life is communicating well, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're building some of the doctrine of salvation based on Abel's life. That's pretty significant. And the scriptures testify of Abel. And Jesus himself on two different occasions speaks of Abel and his righteousness, both in Matthew 23 and Luke chapter 11. It's a pretty significant life, no doubt. The, yet the first person listed as a hero of faith in Hebrews 11 was murdered. Now that's a very good point for this generation to let sink in. Because this generation of Christians in the West thinks that blessings are going to constantly flow for those who are faithful. And the faith chapter of Hebrews 11 wants you to know that here's a man who had great faith. And that faith allowed him to have righteousness and yet he was murdered. In fact, the writer of Hebrews chapter 11 is going to help us to identify at the end of this chapter that this is the prospect for many people of faith. 
So if you have it in your mind that your faith and righteous walks is going to guarantee you prosperity and health and goodness and blessings, then you're probably going to be disappointed. That wasn't Abel's experience, and it is not the experience of many people around the world today. Abel reminds us that terrible things can happen to some very good people. Later in Hebrews 11, the writer tells us that here's some very faithful people who were tortured because they did not denounce their faith. If you go through that list, he says some of them are mocked and flogged, some imprisoned with chains, some of them are stoned to death, sawn in two, killed with a sword. Others live destitute lives and afflicted and mistreated in various ways. Nevertheless, these people, including Abraham, the murder, excuse me, Abel, the murder victim, lived faithfully to God. Faithful people who experience some very harsh realities of this broken world. Faithful people have an eternal perspective, understanding that our rewards and our rest and our wholeness will come in the presence of Jesus Christ in heaven one day. We just trust him. Just have faith in him. That our faith in him today is our provision for eternity for tomorrow. The Bible says that though Abel died, he still speaks. And so he is encouraging us to know that a life lived in faith to God is a life with lasting impact. And that brings me to this final summary statement. Abel expresses a life of eternal impact by faith. It's not by works, not by doing. A life of impact is by faith. Now what is it? that these words say about Abel. If Abel's words are crying out and coming before us and speaking as they are, it says it in the text that they are speaking, still speaking, though he's dead. What is it that they're saying? I think that he's saying first that God is going to vindicate. Cain probably thought he'd get away with it. No, no, no. Not only will he not get away with it, God will vindicate. God vindicates, as Luke 18, 17, 7 says, God will vindicate people of faith. And although we don't know a single word that Abel ever spoke, his righteousness encourages us to live righteously by faith. His life is an expression of that. So so you may not have the ability to speak eloquent words. Okay, I get that. Sometimes my tongue just gets way ahead of me. But our lives can speak. Should we declare the word of God? Absolutely. People come to faith by hearing the word of God. And how do they hear? But by somebody declaring the word of God. But righteousness, righteousness isn't expressed in words alone. Righteousness is expressed through our living. Live righteously and witness before others. Abel was doing that, and in that his words are still speaking to us. And God eternally blesses those who come to him and live by faith. And Abel's words are telling us that, that God blesses people of faith. Now let me ask you as we pause to just contemplate for a moment by faith what God is challenging us. Some of you need to be saved Enough with this working your way, enough with this cultivating your life, enough with this trying to bring forth a harvest of your life of goodness and present it to God and hope he's okay with it. It's proven from the start, from Cain, our works are nothing. Come to him by faith. Trust him with the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who alone can take away your sin and give you his righteousness. Be saved by trusting God who sent his son Jesus as your sacrifice. He substituted for you your sin for his righteousness. Secondly, by faith, walk righteously. Enough with this allowing sin to stay right there at the door. Enough of it letting it hang around. Righteousness is an is an obedient response to walk from the righteous Christ who is now alive in you by his spirit. Stop trying in your own efforts to live and walk righteously. 
Take and receive the righteousness of Christ that is indwelling you by his Holy Spirit and walk from that. And what you'll hear in your life by the Spirit's conviction is, you're not walking in my righteousness right now. And he'll chart you back to the way of righteousness. That's how we do it by faith. Not, God, I'm going to clean up my life and I'm going to walk towards you in righteousness. No, 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 Lord, I trust you to live in me righteously and to have the righteous nature of Christ in me. And I'm going to walk from that by faith. And then live your life with impact by faith. Live your life. Regardless of your profession, live your life by faith. Whether you're in Country Club or Glencoe, Hoax Bluff, Southside, Rainbow City, wherever you live, live your life to the greatest impact by faith. Now let's pray. Father, our great hope and certainty is in Christ. And so for these in the room, I pray, Lord, that saving faith is offered to them today. And they would receive that as a gift given to them by you. And Lord, I pray that as you have given saving grace, that that righteousness that now is deposited in us with the nature of Jesus would be what we walk in and from. And that in doing so, we would have the greatest measure of impact that you prescribe for us. And we would do it by faith, trusting you to do that great work through us. And we express all this to the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.